have uh, so they gave me the title and I think it was probably a bit of a placeholder because they thought I would come up with something better um, but I didn't and I just uh, I kind of took it verbatim as, and the problem is, is it's very wide open then which was great but the problem was it was very wide open so I could talk about just about everything and anything um, and I've kind of narrowed it down quite a bit so I've kind of got two I think kind of two main points because to cover every advancement in selection, I think it's been a great conference. And I think that it was just the culmination here recently with the One Cup AI and, and um, Dr. Steibel's presentation about where we're going with phenotyping. You know, there's, there's a ton of stuff coming up. And um, to cover all that again, that would be, that would be uh, a lot of repeating. So I'm not, um, not planning to um, do that today. So I literally took the title um, verbatim. And if you think about advances in selection, that selection is actually a verb, that the people that are actually selecting their cattle, they're actually selecting the better ones and making progress. And um, the question is, who does the selection? So I think it was Mark McCulley at, uh, on, on the first night, he kind of said, you know, the collective, he kind of pointed to the audience and he said, you know, the, the collective progress of all, everyone there. And that, for me, for BIF, that's always, you got the scientists, the academics, industry people, the breeders, everyone's together. And so that was kind of the collective I think he was talking about. But when it comes to selection, who actually does the selection? And I've got the scientist there with his test tube, although we don't really use test tubes, but that's the, that's the icon I had in, my, in the, in the um, PowerPoint suite. And, um, and the farmer or the rancher or the breeder. And I think for me, it's pretty clear, actually the scientists don't, don't do any selection, right? We don't own any cattle and we don't make any decisions. Right, the breeders own all the cattle. They make all the decisions. So, uh, in my presentation and presentations we've seen so far, you know, we show genetic train graphs, and you know, they look at the progress we've made. Um, well, actually, that's the breeders have done that. Right, the breeders have made that selection. Scientists, um, we don't actually do the selection. So, the little analogy I thought I would I would put forward here. I realized the, the, the trap here because I was looking at the wrong slides, but we're 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 on we're on. We got the right ones up there. So if we think about a baseball player, right? He hits home run. Um, who who hit the home run? The guy that made the baseball bat, or the guy that stood at the plate and swung the bat? And I think we all would agree it's obviously the batter is is the um, the person who uh, hit the home run. And so I just and this is a little bit dangerous because I'm not actually compared to I imagine some people in the audience are real big baseball fans and they're probably going to grimace at my analogy, but. I look up the, um, you know, who hit the most home runs and because it was on the radio here recently and they talked about, you know, the, the, the breaking, breaking, I think it was Babe Ruth's record or something like this. And I thought, Babe Ruth, that's like a long time ago. Is that record still standing? He's still number three in the world for, uh, or number three in, in the world. That's where the baseball exists in the world um, for, not for lifetime home runs or uh, home runs in his career. And at the bottom there, I've got, you know, the year that they finished playing baseball. So 1935, he finished playing baseball and uh, Hank Aaron there in 76 and then Barry, ba Barry Bonds in 2007. Um, but you see the total number of home runs is pretty similar actually. So if you think there's to be, still be the top three from 1935 and just around technology, I think as breeders, if we think back to 1935 and actually doctor, it's a little bit, Ignore the dairy slides from Dr. Steibel this morning because he showed actually the head measurements and they had a sire, they actually had a sire summary and for, for dairy cattle at that time. But this is just, a, I don't know who these people are, I just picked it off the internet the picture just to show, you know, maybe back in the, back in that time frame, this is maybe 30 years before that. But imagine if, we, if, if you think about Babe Ruth, what Babe Ruth, what did he have? He had a baseball bat and a ball, and that's the same as Hank Aaron and, and et cetera their tools haven't really changed. So imagine as breeders, if your tools haven't changed since 1935, um, you'd probably be hitting about the same number of home runs as you did back then, really the tools haven't changed. But our tools have changed remarkably um, from 1935 to today for, um, for cattle. And I think that's, that's kind of the, the message I like to get across is that there's been huge changes in, in selection that the breeders can do with the tools, the tools that um, we put together. So because it's in Canada and because I'm, people sometimes ask me where are you from because I've bounced around a little bit from Canada to New Zealand, back to American Angus to now at Agbu in Australia. So 
people say, well, where are you actually from? And I'm, I'm from Ontario in Canada. So as a Canadian here in Canada at BIF, I thought I'd give a little bit of history, weaving in a little bit of history here, advances in selection, but you know, what's, where does, where's Canada played a role? And when I was, a, when I was a, a graduate student at the time, the Canadian government actually did genetic evaluations for Canada. They did them for pigs and they did them for sheep and, ca and beef cattle and dairy cattle. And this is, um, although I, I'm, uh, you might say I'm a bit of a pack rat, but basically I've got boxes of stuff now I've shipped all around the world. And in that box is, is my, I kept one of these sire summaries and this is it. So I took it, I scanned it in and, uh, but that is from 1994. And if you if you you see the quote there, but there was basically 13 different breeds and, and um, 3,100 young bulls and 2,000 um, proven bulls. But in that sire summary, it's basically birth weight, weaning weight, milk, of course, and and post weaning gain. And but that was that was it was it was a, it was an animal model, and it was it was that was new technology at the time. Um, that didn't last very long. About that, that would be the last one they printed because after that, basically the Canadian government got out of doing genetic evaluations and all the species and they basically privatized it. And we saw Mike Loheis and Filippo presenting here yesterday and they talked about Lactonet Canada, but that was the Canadian Dairy Network was they privatized the dairy group and that was Canadian Dairy Network. But the equivalent for beef is something called Canadian Beef Improvement. But it didn't last. I think it lasted three years and the money ran out and then that was the end of Canadian Beef Improvement. So. Um, that was that was the end of kind of a national program for beef genetic evaluations in in um, in Canada. And I'll come back to that again. But another book I've dragged around as I was digging through my box on my on my uh, bookshelf in the office is is this one from USDA, because back in the '90s, as I started as a as a grad student, like what was what was a hot topic and. I went to the World Congress in Guelph in 1994, and I remember um, Keith Gregory made a presentation about composites and composite breeding and retained heterosis. And that was, there was a lot of research going on at the time around um, composites and composite breeding. You see that sign there from um, Keith Gregory in 1999. And then basically major conclusions, you know, we've got retained heterosis and all the advantages of maybe using um, composite bulls. That was the promise of the 90s, and, and we do see a lot of hybrid bulls, and we saw Mark McCulley's presentation there about, you know, Sim Angus and, and Gelby Angus, and there's a lot of hybrids going on, but if we look at bulls turned out, there's still a lot of purebred bulls getting turned out in the industry, so um, we haven't seen a wholesale um, change in terms of composites taking over, like what we might have predicted back in maybe in the 90s based on those early, early results. But that was in, at the USDA in, uh, in the U.S., but here in Canada, composites and crossbreeding and everything else was really a hot topic as well. And um, I've got two pictures here. The one, you might not recognize the people on the left, but that's actually me a long time ago as a, early, as a young faculty member. And that was our first graduate student. And the gentleman there um, in the vest is Jim Wilton. And so Jim Wilton was at the University of Guelph and he was my mentor. So um, a very, very... Uh, as we've all, we've all, we're all thankful for the people that um, spent time with us and, and things, but Jim, I learned a lot from Jim. But the research station at the time, again, it was, it was basically, we had all these, we had all these rotational crosses. There was, there was a, a four breed rotation and a three breed rotation, and, and I won't list all the breeds, but there's, you know, quite a, quite a potpourri of genetics that we, that we dealt with at the time. And the other picture there in black and white is Roy Berg. And I, I remember, I think it might've been a BIF, but I didn't really interact with, with Roy Berg, but I remember him making a presentation about his composites. And he had, the, the, the results that stuck with me at the time was he had less phenotypic variation in the weaning weight in his composites than he had in his purebreds. And if you think about hybrid vigor and resilience and less, less, um, less uh, health problems, it makes sense. But anyways, there was a lot of work here in Alberta as well around, um, around composite breeding. This is a slide I put together. We've got our national, it's called the uh, ABG Association of uh, Animal Breeding and Genetics meetings in, um, in Perth, Australia at the end of the month. But this is a slide I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about more there. But I thought it would be interesting for the group here is, you know, what's what's happening in, in the breeds people are using over time. And this is Australian data. So the number of registrations through the, through the Australian Registered Cattle Breeders Association. And I didn't put it up just so that 
you know, Herefords could get mad at me because I think it's this is it, it, the data is what the data is. Um, but it just shows how the industry's changed over time. When I was a graduate student, we had we had bull test programs in New York Guelph. There was a uh, a bull test with two hundred bulls in it, and I walked through the bull, through those bulls, and I I'll, there's two hundred bulls. How many how many black Angus bulls were in that bull test in 1995 or whatever it was? There was two. There was two black Angus bulls in that bull test back in 1995. There's a whole pan of Simmentals, a whole pan of Charolais, whole pan of limousines, et cetera. Um, but things, things have changed, and I think everyone knows that story. So the, the blue lines and the, and the yellow lines, that, that's kind of, people would be fairly familiar with that. Um, John told me there's a pointer up here. But I thought I would point out... Um, some other things that are happening, maybe with some of these with some of these smaller breeds. But in Australia, back in the um, back in the eighties, if you look at the Angus line, you know there was a similar number of Angus, Simmental, Shorthorn. You know they were all kind of a similar sized breed, and obviously Angus has, has taken off like it has done around the world. Um, but we've seen some other breeds here take off recently, and and the one there is Wagyu. So basically. You know, Wagyu is basically taking off here in Australia, and they're now they're now number two below Angus, above Herefords, and we'll see in the genotyping slide later they're they're way ahead in terms of um, in terms of genotypes. So I'd say the breeds are changing, and I guess the the back to the the people that make the baseball bats and the people that actually swing the baseball bats. You know, I, I think. The people that swing the baseball bats actually get, they actually choose the breeds that they use. So, and what's the impact, what's the, what's the input from us as a scientist in those decisions? And I think we spend a lot of time as scientists on the genetic trends and the tools really within the breeds, but we don't really have, you know, what's the tools we should have for breeders um, to make these, these, these are big decisions. If you're going to take your whole population, switch it from one breed to another, which is what we're seeing is happening, is it the right decision? Um, the other line that's popping up there is Speckle Park. And you'll see there Speckle Park is actually similar now in, in size in Australia to, to Shorthorn and things that used to be the same size as Angus. So, um, and what data do we actually have on Speckle Park compared to other breeds, like quantitative data, like through something like the Media Research Center is... Um, is probably what we're what we're lacking, but the industry is making making big decisions about changing, changing breeds. So I was in Costco in in um, in Australia recently, and the, I took a picture of this in the meat case. And I don't know what it looks like in the meat case here in Costco, and if we were to go into one in Alberta, but that is that's basically Wagyu in the meat case in Australia for. It's not just in high end butcher shops or something. It's it's there for everyday people like me that shop shop at Costco when they can. So um, you probably can't read the price of that, but there's basically $100 a kilogram. Um, so that kilogram of steak there is $112 for those for those three steaks. Um, you know, that, I think that's a, that's a huge, you know, we didn't see that in the meat case in 1995. You know, there's huge changes that are that have happened in the in the industry. And I think when we look at what People are moving to what breeds and, and making these changes. And we have the same problem with our economic indexes sometimes is what people get paid for actually is a real driver. And um, I think Peter talked yesterday about, you know, yield maximizers and cost minimizers. But I think the part of the psychology is for breeders, it's, it's uh, they all know what they got paid for their cattle. They might not have a really good idea at all their costs. But when they sell their cattle, they usually get one or two checks a year. So it's really simple to keep track of. All your costs are spread across all kinds of things. So, so there's a lot of focus, I find, on, on the revenue side of things. And so we think about end product traits like marbling, weight. You know, it's easy, it's easy for people to, um, to put emphasis on those things. And I think that influences selection a lot. I'm going to take a little pause now from my Canadian history, little history thing. And step into the dairy beef because I, I uh, and this is I'm going to come up with a couple of things that are controversial. But you know, when I was, when I was maybe when I came to present in 1998, I was probably too nervous, so I would never be controversial. But I'll be a bit more controversial today. So, um, so we all know that we all know the dairy beef. It's been it's been talked about at the conference already, and why it is there with sex semen. But I think what I I think what I would I'd like to challenge people with on the dairy beef side 
because Jason Archer and I, we put together some dairy beef indexes for Australian Angus at the time with Abacus Bio and Peter and Cheryl that's here and John Crowley um, were all involved. Um, but I remember going to see a, a dairy breeder as part, of the, as part of our kind of research. And I kind of floated this idea that, well, really, you know, when you're selecting your dairy bulls, of course, that's half the genetics. So, you know, you could, you, what about beef traits in the, whoa, you know, we're not going to be putting any emphasis on beef traits for our Holsteins. You know, there's just, you know, get that thought out of your head. We're never going to do that. Um, but I think if we think about a whole supply chain um, and you've got dairy cows and we've got the beef cat or we've got the bull calves and are going off um, through a supply chain that's generating significant revenue now, um, that's a whole, that's a whole, we should look at the whole supply chain, not just the dairy, and then the beef is something else. You need to put the two things together. So I've got the, 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 uh, the genome that I'm looking at here, the blue and the pink. Um, the blue obviously comes from the Angus bull, but the pink there comes from that Holstein cow. And right now we're, we're totally building these supply chains around the blue chromosome only, and we're, we're ignoring half the genetics. And so if I look at the selection emphasis for dairy cattle in Canada, and this is off the website, and you don't, don't bother reading it too much, but there's no beef traits there. It says rump, but that's not rump fat or rump, rump um, anything. It's to, do with, it's to do with dairy traits. So there's no beef traits, obviously, in the, in the dairy indexes. But I, I'm just, as a, I don't, I just, I just have this, um, you know, what variation is there for marbling in Holsteins? You know, how much is there, are there actually some Holstein bulls that actually produce great marbling compared to poor marbling? And should we identify that? It would be pretty easy nowadays to identify those things because cows are all genotyped. Um, you know, we follow these steers through. We could get steered aid on the half-bloods and we could actually prove Holstein bulls for beef traits. And that's, that's um, I think that would be, again, what's the other half, the other half of the genome in those calves. So this is, this is where I'm gonna be really controversial. So and when I was, in, when I was a, a professor at the university and we taught students, we talked about, we've got beef breeds and we've got dairy breeds. But at the time we talked about some other breeds that were we called dual purpose. There were dual purpose breeds that were good for beef and milk back in the day. We don't really talk about those anymore. But I think the reality is now with dairy beef, is that we need to look at these Holsteins different. And I'm gonna change my slide here now. You might not notice it, but I'm gonna change dairy breed there now to dual, dual purpose breed. That these Holsteins aren't dairy cattle, they're actually dual purpose cattle. We milk them, but obviously, well, we eventually eat the cow, but their progeny now are actually contributing to the beef chain. So they're a dual purpose, really a dual, we're back to a dual purpose cow. And I guess my challenge is, do we actually change the selection emphasis in the Holsteins to actually consider the whole supply chain? Including, um, including the beef traits. And I realized, you know, the Holstein guys right now are shaking their heads and saying, Steve, you're, you're, not, you're not convincing anybody. Um, so while I'm down the controversial path, I thought I'd keep it going. But there's something else that was happening back in the 90s, and that was around twinning. And at the USDA mark, they had a twinning line, and they got them up, I think, 50 or 60% twins through selection. Um, but people were looking at other ways to make twins. And this was a paper out of Guelph, again, with my advisor there, Jim Wilton, but they're basically using embryos to create twins. So, you know, if you put two embryos in, you get twins, or you could breed the cow and also put in an embryo and you get twins. Um, so that all worked. But of course, back then, embryos were really expensive. But today with IVF and the fact you could go into packing plants and get, and get um, oocytes from packing plants, you can actually generate a lot of IVF embryos and they're a lot cheaper. So does it, does it change the dynamic now with, with um, making twins with embryos because I'm not a dairy guy. So I just look at these Holsteins as they're just a, a big uterus. So let's use them. So why don't we stick in, as you know, if, 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 uh, if breeding them to a beef bull is a good thing, well, putting a beef embryo in would be twice a good thing. So we got, we got all the beef genetics there. So instead of breeding them, let's put a beef embryo in. But then I say, well, instead of putting one beef embryo in, why don't we put two um, and have twins? And the dairy guy said, well, hell no, I'm never gonna do that. But we talked yesterday about methane, and I realized with the, uh, uh, they're up. I've just changed my language. I said methane instead of methane. So I'm, I call me Australian now. But they, but they, uh, we talked yesterday about the overhead in terms of uh, methane production. The bill for methane is actually a lot of it's to do with how much your mother produced, right? 
So you can imagine now if that mother's actually producing two calves instead of one, we've just halved the methane debt that that calf is born with, which is, which would be phenomenal. Um, so anyways, I'll put it out there as, as a couple ideas in terms of where we could maybe go with the, with the beef on dairy space, because you could half, your, half that methane debt in um, with that technology, which I think is a lot different than, than it was. So back to back to kind of my my tour through Canada, um, I said you know I've, I've in some ways I look at uh, my career but feel a bit like Forrest Gump in a lot of ways. If you remember the Forrest Gump movie, but he's he was always in these situations and he met people and and, and uh, so through my career you know you've, you've had a great experience to meet a lot of people and you learn a lot of things from different people as as you go through um, as you go through things. So my first my first foray back to Canada again, but Gord Vandervoort and Gord shared me this data. Um, if we look at cause and effect, this is this was this was records into our provincial recording program in Ontario at the time, and think, okay, I came out of I just started in grad school about 1993, and if you look on the graph there, what happened in 1993 is recording just fell like a stone, right? That's the Steve Miller effect. Um, but actually, what what was happening there is they were actually subsidizing the producers to collect data because they thought, well. Genetic improvements were really important. So if we get breeders collecting the data, they'll realize they could make better cattle and then eventually they'll do it themselves. We wouldn't have to pay them anymore. So they pulled the plug on the funding and we'll see, well, you see what happened. Basically the producers just said, well, you're not paying me, so I'm not gonna collect it anymore. So I kind of learned a little bit about incentivizing people to do things. And I think it would be very, very careful if we just flat out pay people to do stuff. I think that's can give the wrong incentive sometimes. But that program and that bull test program um, generated a lot of data. So that 100,000 records coming in a year, there's only about 400,000 cows in the province at that time. So to think about a quarter of all the cattle, commercial cattle actually being recorded is a lot of data. And it was multi-breed data because everyone was doing a lot of crossbreeding at the time. So we had we had instantly had this kind of large multi-breed data set that was put together um that we could analyze and that's what i did as part of my phd is i analyzed the data and we developed a, a multi-breed genetic evaluation and that was new and in, in back in that at that time but there was also these bull test stations and they generate a lot of ultrasound data and they had feed intake with a couple thousand feed intake records back in the 90s we had a we had a genetic evaluation for um for feed efficiency and ultrasound but still you know we saw the we saw the participation in the program dropped now, ag sites still exist today, and Gord works for ag sites, and they still do genetic evaluations, but they're also involved in a lot of other things, and um, you can visit with, with them. But the diff, I think one of the key factors, this is not to do anything with genetics, but it has to do with economics and social science, but what was, you know, why, why walk away from a national genetic evaluation in Canada? And this, is, this was a slide I used in, in Australia to kind of, to kind of um, educate them a little bit because obviously you know Australia doesn't land border with anybody so you can't hook your, you know the fact that you can get a hook on a gooseneck trailer in Montana or Nebraska or whatever and drive up and buy a bowl in Alberta and take it home again is a huge market right and so if you're a Canadian breeder especially when American guys are coming up with 80 cent dollars they're they're a good thing to have at your sale and uh, so they want to have a common currency across the border so they want they don't want to have a Canadian EPD that's not that won't talk to the American EPDs and when the guy takes the bull home he doesn't know if he's going to go up or go down to the American system so having animals all on the same playing field in North America makes a lot of sense and I think that was the bottom line is is why we why we ended up with what we have with a lot of the breeds doing joint evaluations with the U.S. because it's basically one market for 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 live bulls so there we were with this multi-breed database a multi-breed evaluation doing ultrasound and carcass and feed efficiency and things and um, Lee Leachman at the time, and this is where we'd run into Lee at BIF and, and uh, visit with him. But eventually he said, well, what would it look like to do, you know, run my data through your system? And um, Gord, Gord's been doing that here um, lately. And I haven't been involved for uh, over 10 years now. So, um, but back in the day, um, we, did, we did that and we developed, we took our index that we had developed and we applied it to lease cattle and lead changed the economic parameters and things and called it dollar profit and i remember making the presentation at that lease sale in 2003 about the economics and this dollar profit index and just to put it in perspective dollar beef didn't show up in american angus till 2004 so really 
indexes in the beef industry at the time where that was, in, that was a new thing. But I learned a bit of a lesson there about kind of adoption as well, because you have, and Lee's not here, Cody's here, but everyone knows Lee, but obviously Lee's a bigger than life person and he makes a big, and he, and, and, um, he, gets, he gets a lot of enthusiasm around him. And so after, you know, he, Dollar Profit had been going for a few years and it was really successful and we had him come up and present in, can in Canada in Ontario. So we had this bull test program in Ontario and we had the indexes that breeders had had since 1996. They'd had those indexes since 1996. Lee comes and makes his presentation and the breeder comes up to me afterwards and he says, he goes, you see, we need an index like that. We need an index like that Dollar Profit. I mean, you've had it since 1996, but obviously you, you need a champion, right? Behind some of these things. The egg head at the university wasn't selling it for, for, for seven or eight years, um, but Lee Leachman could, could and, it, and it's been highly successful. And again, I've been out of it for 10 years and things have, 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 have evolved as they, as they should over time. So, um, but that was, that was kind of where we were, but something else that was going on at the time is, if I, if I step back when I was just in, in, I was just about to start grad school and I was working for my, who was going to be my professor for the summer. And one of the, he was in animal breeding, but he was, he was, I remember at the, we were kind of at a coffee pot there in the basement. And it was literally, it was one of these ones where he kind of was like, hey buddy, you know, hey buddy. He's like, what, what, what do you, what do you, are you going to start, a, are you going to start a PhD here? Or? I said, yeah, he goes, there's, you know, you should go over across the road. They're, they're doing molecular genetics over there. They're going to find all the genes. This, this stuff's not going to, there's no future in this. You know, you're in the wrong place. Now's your time to make the switch. And I thought, oh, wow. Well. But I like working with Jim and cattle and everything. So I stayed where I was. Um, but it was, it was also around that time, I think we, all, we kind of hit a real dry spell in terms of funding and research. Basically, if, if, if you didn't have molecular, if you weren't doing something molecular in terms of genetic, you weren't going to get funded. So had to kind of jump on that bandwagon. So we started looking, okay, let's try and find the genes and things um, at the time. And so I've got some papers here from, from Canada. You know, we found, we found SNPs and Calpastat to do with tenderness. And we found and other people at um, Saskatchewan, Fiona Buchanan, I've got her paper up there and, and Steve Moore's group in Alberta. Um, you know, they found lots of actually mutations in, in different genes that cause differences in beef traits. And my other example, I don't know if uh, Stuart Box in the room here, but um, just in terms of adoption and uh, commercialization of tools, this was, you know, for, we, we, we presented our work up in Edmonton around this Kelpostatin SNP that we had found, and it had a big effect on tenderness because Kelpostatin has a big, big impact on tenderness. And Stuart Bach calls up and he says, I saw your poster, your presentation there in animal science. What, what are you doing with that SNP? And then in terms of commercialization, it was like, it's, it's, it's like they just, they just, you know, they, they, they wanted it and they just kind of ripped it out of your hands. And they said, you know, the next week, I think he had us on a plane down to Georgia to, to present there at Mariel at the time. And, um, and they um, patented it and put it and sold it. And, um, but at that time, of course, we didn't have a 50 K chip. We had, all these we're looking at all these major major mutations and they had a panel of 300 and something of these and a lot of them came from canada a lot of them came from steve moore's group and and different places and they were used in genetic evaluations like american angus brought it in as a correlated trait back back in the day but that's kind of this kind of patch in between in terms of the early stages of early days of genomics and then suddenly in 2005 the chip shows up and the original chip was it wasn't actually a 50k it was a 10k but we didn't use the 10k for much because the 50k quickly replaced it and i can remember making a presentation in um at a gentech conference i think it was back up in edmonton or maybe it was down here in calgary i can't remember but it was in around 2010 and i had a slide up there where i had a chicken and an egg and i was i was basically making the point that we had the what comes first and and, and so the point was once we actually get a, a a prediction that's up and working, um, you know, this, this thing will kind of feed itself. And that's, and that's where we are. The dairy, the dairy industry and, and um, was first off the ranks and they had, they had the results. They had, they had 4,000 and something bulls in Canada that were highly proven and genotyped. And that was their training population. They kind of had that overnight. 
and it was successful and they, and they showed it worked and it was accurate. The question was, can we make it work in beef cattle? Well, I think today now I'll tell you today that the rest, the rest of all that is, is history. Um, this is another uh, faculty member at, at Guelph and he wrote a paper in 2006. So the, the chip came out in 2005. Larry publishes the paper in 2006 saying, this is gonna double the rate of genetic progress in dairy cattle. And of course that's like, dairy cattle are already making a lot of progress. How can you times that by two? And could that even be possible? And, and of course, Larry was absolutely right. He was actually underestimated a little bit because his data was based on that 10K data. He didn't have the 50K data yet. So that's, um, but at this time, we, we're still not out. We're still, we're still wondering, what, what are we gonna do in beef cattle? We're gonna find all the genes um, or we, is it gonna be this where we've ended up today with genomic selection? And just another Canadian note, this was a large project in Canada uh, sequencing, the idea was we're going to impute everything to sequence, we'll find the genes, and we'll, we'll do even a better job with the cosmic mutations. Um, and at that time, we were contributing the sequence to the Thousand Bull Genomes Project, and literally, it, it, was, it was pretty much all the beef data in the Thousand Bull Genomes Project. We submitted like 400 bulls or something. It was, so that's a lot of data from Canada that goes into an international project that I think is, um, is great. So that's, that's now history, and now we're in the, the, the phase, and everyone's in the phase. Genomic selection's here. People are using it, and this is results from, um, from a, the Australian system breed plan. So people say, what do you do in Australia, Steve? Agbu develops, does the research and development behind, behind breed plan, and Hugh Neverson and ABRI um, commercializes it. So that's, that's the synergy right there in, in the town of Armadale where we are. But these are genotypes in the breed plan analysis. And you'll see there's over half a million now genotypes across the breeds and some breeds like, this is actually six months out of date, things change fast. I think Angus is over 300,000 now, Christian Duff is in the room, but um, everything's, everything's increasing fast. And breed plan is used right around the world and they do about over 60 different genetic evaluations in different breeds in different countries. So it has a, has a, has a big impact. These are some of the results, you know, is it accurate? What's, what's the increase in accuracy? So this is some research done recently and it's gonna be presented here at the end of the month by David Johnson. A lot of people here will know David from BIF from a lot of years, from uh, originally did his PhD at Georgia, State, Georgia, University of Georgia. But these are the increases in accuracy with, with, um, with genomics, with single step genomics in, in these breed plan evaluations for the different breeds. And you see here, the accuracy improvement is not the same in each breed because the reference populations aren't the same. And so the one message, and I'll show you in a minute, is the bigger your reference population, the more accuracy you have. But even at the lower end, that the percentage increase in accuracy there is actually quite significant. So some of these breeds, it's like a 50% or better improvement in accuracy on, on a young animal. And if you think about genetic progress, it's directly proportional to this value of accuracy that I've got printed here. That's not BIF accuracy. That's what we call the traditional animal breeder accuracy. So that's a little bit different, but your selection progress is actually directly proportional to that. So if you increase that by 50%, you're gonna make 50% more progress, all, th all other things being equal. So if we look at this, at the different reference population sizes and the accuracy increase, and we did, uh, David's done a bit of an analysis here, you'll see here that this, Accuracy continues to go up as the data set gets bigger. That's really the message. You, you, the biggest wins are in the beginning, obviously, when you go from zero records to 5,000, obviously your accuracy shoots way up. But even still, as we go from five to 10 to 15 to 20 to 30, um, it's still going up. And I think that's, uh, that's something we didn't know back in 2010. We didn't know, you know, you know are we gonna have to keep measuring animals? Are we gonna have to keep building the database? And the answer is the database, you can still do better um, the more and the bigger we make the database. So here it is on a logarithmic scale and it's pretty much linear on that logarithmic scale that we're still continuing to go up. The bigger the training population, the more accuracy we're getting. We have another uh, scientist at Agbu, Kirsty Moore, and kirsty has been um, doing a lot more theoretical work behind accuracy and actually, you know, what's all the mechanisms. And here's accuracy with different, it's really the same story, but it's accuracy with different levels of heritability in theory. And this is for a typical Boss Taurus breed in Australia. But again, um, it continues to go up. It's the big gains at the beginning, but continues to go up the bigger, the bigger our population gets. So obviously, you know what, what we didn't know in the beginning, or we're going to find all the genes and we don't know, maybe we don't even need any data. Well, but that's not true. 
Um, and what we've realized, what the reality is now is that um, we need the data. And the more data we have, the more progress we're going to make. So um, more data and obviously more traits. You know, I think it came up yesterday around the dairy and with fertility. And the point is, yeah, it's lowly heritable, but if we have, you know, we can have a lot of proven sires with a lowly heritable trait that can train the genomics and we can use it in young animals. More traits, more accuracy, more progress, more data, more traits, more accuracy, more progress. And that's the wheel of selection. So if I got one message today is basically this is real. This is the opportunity for beef cattle breeders today. Um, the faster you can make this wheel turn, the more, the more progress you're going to make. And without data, we can't do anything. So I think the first time I heard this, a blupper, I was called a blupper by, by Mark Gardner. He said, oh, you're a blupper. And that's because it's best linear unbiased prediction is the technology behind a genetic evaluation. But that, that's, your, that's my trade, I guess. So I'm, I'm a blupper. And I give you my, the blupper's view on the monarchy because it was John, John Crowley, I think, who presented, but it was, he was quoting um, Mike Coffey from the UK, who's basically said, in the land of genotype, the phenotype is king. But I'm gonna I'm gonna crown a new a new king today. So I'm not gonna put the crown on the phenotype or the genotype. I'm gonna put the crown on on the black box. So I think all this time the black box of genetic evaluation has remained the king. So we had EPDs, and that was basically a black box. And now we've got genomics, but it's just feeding the same black box. But the black box is still ruling today. And we've tried to we've tried to dethrone the black box. We've said, well. If we find the cause of mutations, let's put them in the genetic evaluation. We can increase the accuracy and stuff, but we haven't actually managed to do that. The black box still, um, still wins, and that's it's good. It's good, but that's just reality. So we think about why are we making more progress with genomic selection in the dairy cattle side. They could they basically drop their their generation interval drastically because they didn't have to they didn't have to prove these bulls. But in beef cattle, well, we use a lot of yearling bulls already, so we don't really have the opportunity to drop the generation interval that much. But Rob Banks, who was my predecessor at Agbo, he was doing a paper and he was interviewing Kelly Retallick and I, um, and he said, oh, well, have you actually seen the, the average age of the parents decrease with genomics? And I thought, well, actually, we haven't looked, so let's have a look. And so we pulled up the average age of bulls and cows that generate calves in the database, and lo and behold, if you think about where 2010 is there, when we started genomics, it's been a steady drop in the age of sires since then. And so again, who makes the baseball bats, who swings the baseball bats, but the people out there selecting the bulls and everything else must be, instead of saying, well, I got to wait for this bull to get proven for, for carcass traits before I use them. They're making some decisions that say, well, actually, I'm going to take a, take a shot on a bull. Um, based on the data I have now with genomics with more accuracy and use a younger bull. So that's one thing that's increasing, increasing progress. Having said all this about increasing progress, I have this, 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 this slide perplexes me. And I, I liked looking at um, genetic trends because to me, it's kind of like taking the pulse on something, you know, so you're looking after genetic evaluation, you're checking your genetic trends, do they make sense? Is it real? Um, is there something we need to adjust? But why is this so linear, right? This yearling weight trend, this is this, you can get it off the website. This is American Angus yearling weight trend. The R squared from 1972 to today is 0.9986. So there's no deviation. So we say, well, over that time period, we, we ramped up performance recording. We put in EPDs. We went to a full animal model. We went more multiple trait. We, we added genomics and still it's, 2.96 pounds per year EPD um, since 72 to today hasn't changed. That still perplexes me. I guess the point, the point Mark McCauley was making, I think on Tuesday night, if it was Tuesday night, uh, Monday night, was that, well, you've added more traits. So actually the proportion emphasis now in yearling weight has actually gone way down. Um, but we still, to me, that's, if I extrapolate out, if the past 30 years has been a prediction of, or past 50 years has been a prediction of the next, um, so many by 2050, our average yearling weight EPD in Angus will be 200 roughly. Um, uh, does the past predict the future? Let's let's see. Some other some other trends. This is also I so I give a presentation and, and it was to do with embryo transfer society and and how do we how do we make more progress with with embryo transfer? But this is this is the dollar C index. So this is your all-purpose maternal combined index for Angus and the. 
And it, so it's going up and that's not a surprise in the orange. But what we also looked at is what's the standard deviation of the index? So how much variation is there within a year between animals? And it's also going up. And for me, that's actually maybe even more important in some cases than at the fact that it's going up because we're identifying more spread now. So the genomics is identifying more spread because you're more accurate across all the traits, uh, but we've got more traits. And so we're actually pulling apart the um, profitability on those cows more, identifying the top ones better. And I, I was expecting with all the technology up here, there would actually be a, a, a timer, but where am I at for time, John? Two minutes. Okay. The other thing with, with, with our marbling trend, I think that was really interesting is it's, it's kicked up a lot in this last, last few years in Angus. And I thought that was um, another little phenomenon that I thought was worth sharing. It's actually doubled in the last five years compared to the previous five years in Angus, which I think is, is really amazing. Just around, so these are some uh, Australian examples. This is the uh, all-purpose index, ABI and Angus, and then a Merino sheep. And we basically see a 50% increase in Merinos and 20% increase in Angus. And so we think that's, that's great. 50% or 20% more progress is a lot. But this is the, um, the dairy index on top of that. So it's all standardized. We can compare them. But they're doing four times what they used to do. In, in dairy cattle. And part of that is because of new traits. You know, they were, they were horrible for fertility. They've got fertility now fixed, or they've got a tool now with genomics and they're using it and they've turned their index around uh, considerably. So I think the upside with, with the technology is, is there and it's amazing. My last slide back to Forrest Gump, I guess, this is him running across America. Um, if I think about, you know, what's the future? And we saw a lot of the technology coming today, but I think there's, um, it's, uh, I don't want to predict it, I guess, because I wouldn't have predicted that we'd be here uh, where we are today back in 19, 1992. So, but the recipe I think for breeders at the moment is, is really clear, more data, more accuracy, more progress. It's just there for you, for you to use really. Thanks.